This is the new way we work from Fast Company Magazine, where we take listeners on a journey through the changing landscape of our work lives and explain exactly what we need to build the future we want. I'm Fast Company Deputy Editor, Kate Davis. Despite all that we've learned about the importance of emotional intelligence at work, despite the shift that we felt towards worker empowerment, flexibility, and a more humane way of working, there can still be a lot about living and working in 2023 that feels slightly dystopian. The news is filled with layoffs, economic uncertainty, and as we've covered in the last two episodes, the rise of artificial intelligence in fields and skills that were once thought of as human-exclusive knowledge work. Add to that the rise in so-called bossware, monitoring software that companies use to ensure that employees are staying productive. And it's not an anomaly at just a few companies. Research found that 8 out of 10 of the largest private U.S. employers are using some form of employee surveillance software. Unsurprisingly, employee surveillance rose as remote work did. When bosses couldn't physically monitor employees, they put programs in place to do it. A study of over 1,200 U.S. employers found that 60% with remote employees are using some form of work monitoring software, and almost 9 out of 10 companies said that they had fired workers after implementing monitoring software. So what exactly are employers tracking and what tools are they using? Are there any regulations around employee surveillance? Does your boss even have to tell you if you're being monitored? Yeah, the laws vary from terrible to non-existent in most states. Some states require notification to employees, but notification doesn't always, uh, it doesn't actually mean telling people in a way where they understand. You know, oftentimes this can be fine print that gets buried in inside some lengthy handbook. Oftentimes it can be a quick mention as part of orientation. That's Albert Foxconn. He's the founder and executive director at the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. He's also a fellow at Yale Law School and the Harvard Kennedy School. I asked him how widespread the use of employee monitoring programs are and how much has the increase in remote work impacted it? Well, the full version is we don't know because oftentimes there's no requirement to disclose when employees are being tracked in this way. It varies tremendously from state to state. And a lot of the times it's a guessing game how people are being watched, how that information is being used. Is uh, artificial intelligence being involved? Is there productivity monitoring? And just really how is the life of an employee, especially someone working in the home, increasingly being monitored by their uh, boss? What we know anecdotally, though, is that there are a lot of vendors selling a lot of invasive tools that would expand dramatically the capability that employers have to watch all of us when when we're doing our work. Yeah, and I want to get into that later, kind of the legality of like, how do you know? And and like, is there any regulation? But, you know, since we don't have the hard numbers on it, you know, you mentioned you've seen the amount of vendors selling these things. I can only assume, and, you know, we've read a, a bit about as soon as, and it makes sense, you know, on one level, as soon as employees started working remotely, you know, bosses and companies wanted to kind of track them more. Do you know any numbers of increase in in these sorts of products around the time that people started working remotely more? Well, we we saw a deluge of interest and uh, and announcements in the remote work uh, surveillance space once the pandemic hit, because suddenly you had all of these companies that were used to working in person, people were working remotely, and all of these managers started freaking out. Oh my God, I can't see what my employee is doing at every moment. I have to find a way to track them. And so we saw, you know, tech giants like Microsoft and other, you know, incumbent firms rolling out this sort of tattleware as part of their existing products. We saw new startups rolling out new forms of surveillance that could be added on to remote work. We saw productivity monitoring. We saw ways to measure when you had digital absenteeism. And all of this premised on the idea that somehow if you couldn't see your employee, you couldn't trust them to do their job. But that entire premise, the fear, none of that was actually substantiated by hard evidence. And one of the things I always like to point out to people is that managers assumed that they needed this technology. They assumed they needed to be able to invade our lives in order to have a high quality remote work environment. But the truth is that this software demoralizes folks. It feels incredibly invasive when they are aware of it. 
And there's no proof that it actually is needed to ensure that your team is doing a good job. I know that as someone who runs a nonprofit who has to oversee a lot of people's work day to day, that this is not the way I would want to make sure my team is feeling motivated and is actually doing their work every day. Yeah, and that's kind of the biggest thing that I, I wanted to talk about today. And and the idea for this episode came to me when I was at a conference, you know, last year with what I assumed was a lot of very progressive business leaders. And somebody asked, you know, how many are you are using productivity tracking? software of some kind. I thought, oh, nobody. I'm surely nobody in this group. And like literally 70% of them raised their hands. I found it as really shocking. And like, as you say, you know, in our coverage of these surveillance tech, employees have described being tracked as, as you said, demoralizing, humiliating, and toxic. And it seems kind of obvious to us that these kinds of tactics would be unpopular with employees and bad for morale and bad for retention. But what would you advise companies and managers to do instead if they're feeling this like need to to monitor and track their employees? Well, well, first, like we have to actually unpack what's meant by productivity monitoring, because that's how a lot of these tools are sold to us. But productivity is a really complicated concept. It's all the different things that go into the quality of your work, the the not just you know the number of keystrokes per day. But the software isn't capable of making a holistic assessment of how good a job we're doing. So it reduces our job performance to these really simple metrics. And so one of the first things I always ask employers, if you feel the need to track productivity, how are you measuring it? And how do you make sure that you are not reducing the goal that your employees have to this dumbed down version of job performance? Because I can imagine in a demoralized work setting where people know they're being tracked at every minute when they know their entire work life is being reduced to this simple statistic, well, they can just do what Homer Simpson did. You know, <laughs> I was waiting and- <laughs> to bring that up. That's the first thing I thought of. The 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 water bird that that exactly. hikes the key. Yep. Exactly. And that, it may sound like a ludicrous and idiotic example, but that is what a lot of these systems do. They turn human beings who are dealing with complicated issues into the water bird that's just pecking away at the key over and over again to make sure that someone knows that they're there. That is not management. That is just really poorly designed software. So instead, well, employers need to actually have a work culture where people feel excited to come into the office or the virtual office, where they're actually engaging with their employees as human beings, where people have ownership of projects in a way that actually makes them interested in doing the work. All of the basics of effective employee engagement that, quite frankly, should be common sense in management, but all too often are are this illusory mystery to people who want to treat human beings like robots. It does feel obvious, you know, like, and we've talked about it a lot on the show about having a results, you know, based culture rather than a like time in front of the computer based culture and, you know, especially allowing for flexibility. I think, you know, like a point that you brought up too is that these kind of tracking programs tracks performative productivity. You know, you can see how many emails or whatever that you're doing, but they lack kind of the nuance of what work is. And I was thinking about how like, well, so much of especially kind of creative work is thinking and like sitting and thinking. And that's not, you can't track that on your computer. You know, there's not a a way to, to track how somebody is coming up with ideas. One thing I would add on that point, I would ask of of the 70% of people in that room who are using productivity tools to monitor the people who report to them, how many of them would feel comfortable having those same tools to measure their job performance for the people they report to? Because what I often find is that when you talk to managers about having these same metrics for their own job performance, they'll say, well, no, 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 my job is different. My job is complicated. My job has all these nuances that won't be picked up by the tool. And you have to ask, well, why is it any different for the people who are reporting to you? Yeah. That's what they think. I mean, and there's so much of, 
I think of the days when everybody was in the office and especially, you know, one of the the complaints in like the big open office settings is that everybody can see your screen and you feel very self-conscious mm-hmm. about what you're looking at when you're like, oh, I need to, I'm checking social media for a second or I'm online shopping for a second or I'm doing something that actually is work but maybe doesn't look like work. It's that same sort of like feeling watched all of the time and feeling like you're being treated like a child. Yeah, and not to mention terrible cybersecurity <laughs> practice to have your you know login screens visible to everyone. But true, that, that's true. Yeah, that show. is. Yeah. Oh God, the, all the all the ways. Yeah. Um, well, let's back up a little bit and kind of because we've kind of like skimmed the surface of what's out there in the land of employee surveillance. So I think kind of the most common thing that people think of is these kind of bossware, you said, I think you called it tattleware, uh, programs that kind of monitor productivity, like mouse jiggles and the Homer Simpson key stroke thing. What are some of the other things that companies are doing to monitor employees? And and what does kind of employee surveillance look like differently across industries too? Yeah, if, if there's an aspect of remote work life, there is someone out there trying to monetize it as a surveillance tool. So it's looking at the number of emails you send, the number of documents you edit, looking at every touch point you have in the you know remote work space. It also can be increasingly the use of your webcam. We've seen really problematic instances, particularly with call center workers, where for supposed quality assurance purposes, they would be forced to have their webcam on in their home, monitoring them as they were doing their work. And not only could the webcam see them, but a lot of people have childcare responsibilities, you know, other family care responsibilities. And so other people in the home are having their privacy violated and their images recorded just so that this company can sort of make sure this person is supposedly doing their job. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm most concerned about is attention tracking and the use of computer vision to make some sort of assessment about someone's cognitive state at the workplace. And, and we've seen this in ed tech, we've seen this in remote learning environments, and it hasn't been as prominent in the uh, workplace setting, but I think it's only a matter of time. And what's really alarming about this is not only is it really invasive to have computer vision constantly making judgments about, are you paying attention, are you not? But it often is going to be wrong. It's often going to be particularly biased against individuals with disabilities, neurodivergent individuals, and anyone whose you know behavior pattern doesn't match the training data for the AI model. Can you explain a little bit more what that is that's tracking people's facial expressions or how does that work? Yeah, so this is something that Zoom threatened to roll out, but then didn't, Where uh, and what a number of other companies have actually deployed. And it would look at your facial expression and make a judgment about whether or not you're paying attention to the conversation. So if you have, you know, 200 people on a Zoom webinar and they have their cameras off, but you you want an easy metric of how many people are actually engaged in the conversation. There are tools out there that say they can do this, but it's very easy to then turn that into an individualized score of like, well, how much attention were you actually paying in the all hands meeting? How much attention were you actually paying at those events? Are you checked out? But not only is that invasive, it's oftentimes going to be pseudoscience because there's no (laughs) peer-reviewed, independently verified evidence that any of these tools are going to be effective across the board, because so many of us will express our internal state differently through our external expression. Yeah, this sounds like there's so much room for error with that. I'm assuming a lot of that involves AI, and like things are only as accurate as the humans who design them. And yeah, there's just so much room for error there. And it does feel like it's trying to replace such a human skill of actually managing the people that you work with and and finding out if they're paying attention rather than like tracking their facial expressions. Yeah, exactly. And all of these tools try to take really complex, heavily personalized processes that take a lot of experience and a lot of training and a lot of savvy to actually deploy effectively as a manager and try to you know, turn it into a simple product. And the products just aren't capable of doing it. I know everyone loves the chat GPT and Dolly uh, stories as showing just 
how powerful AI can be. And it can be powerful in certain ways. But when it comes to the sort of AI tools we see being deployed in the workplace and some of the more simplistic data gathering uh, measures, this is just not a replacement for human judgment. It's not even close. So I want to go a little bit further down this kind of bleak dystopian path. And, you know, whenever I think about employee surveillance, I think about this story that we did a few years ago where we covered a company that was offering to have employees get a microchip implanted so that they could track all sorts of things, but they were selling it to the employees. It's like you could use it as the key card to get in the building and like that sort of things. There's obviously lots of similarish things on the market right now, like the aura rings that track, you know, sleep and heart rate and health. And they're used a lot by professional athletes, which makes sense. But what's kind of the next gen of employee surveillance that's coming down the pike for us? Oh, God. Yeah. So any of the health surveillance that's being offered to employees terrifies me because it gives employers such a broad window into the intimate private lives of their employees. And especially for health tech in a post ops America, when so many you know, people who are pregnant or could become pregnant are really living in terror of the sort of legal regimes there that exist in their states. This, you know, creates a lot of potential legal risk for the employees because devices that are designed to just track your sleep pattern and track your movement, do all those sorts of things, they can often track a lot of other incidental data points in the process. You know, in terms of the idea of getting something injected into your body by an employer, I mean, like, this is basically a James Bond villain plot in real life. And I think people oftentimes don't understand the long-term consequences. First of all, you're sticking something in your body. That's not great. You know, <laughs> we have, we oftentimes don't know what the 30-year health impact of that's going to be because, you know, people haven't been doing this for 30 years. The second part is, you can use a parabolic amplifier and, and uh, an antenna array to like oftentimes track these signals from a lot further away than people realize. So even if you're talking about an NFC signal that can only be accessed normally from a few inches away, that can actually, if someone really wants to track you, be tracked from much further away. We, we've seen this, for example, with so-called Bluetooth sniper rifles, where people were able to set up uh, antennas that allowed them to effectively track Bluetooth signals from, I, I believe it was over a mile away in one case. And so the privacy impact, it can be like really alarming. And I, I just think that this is the sort of product that is offered by managers who are oblivious to just the diverse privacy needs of their employees because something that might seem, oh, harmless to have that NFC chip in your arm if you're you know super privileged and super secure, if you have criminal justice involvement, if you're undocumented, if you're at heightened risk of being targeted by government agencies for any reason, suddenly the risk profile is going to be very different. And it's just something that, quite frankly, I, I just do not think should be legal. Because, you know, one of the crucial things we always say is that very few things are truly voluntary in a work setting, because there's always the fear that if you don't consent, you'll lose your job. And so I always will ask, sure, you have people signing paperwork before they get this chip injected that says it's of their free will. But how many people would genuinely have done that? if they weren't trying to impress the boss or if they weren't worried about being the one person who says no. Yeah, and I think, you know, that example is, feels extreme. And it does, you know, I think a lot of people would would bristle at that. But I always think of how much we voluntarily give away, right? The, our smartphones are tracking devices and we carry them around all the time and we don't think twice about it. What, you know, as far as that goes, what would you advise people with, you know, because there's the one thing we've been talking about tracking your keystrokes onto your computer and the, and the, those sorts of things. But what about the other device that we carry around with us all the time and linking that to like our personal phones to our employers? Yeah. So, I mean, I run an organization, so I ha have an HR manual like everyone else. And I had a wonderful outside lawyer uh, who's very kind and 
volunteered his time and he drafted us uh, a manual and he put in the standard language about mobile devices. And I was horrified because it basically gave us free reign to access our employees' private devices. And to me, that just is unacceptable as a baseline norm for employees in 2023. That, you know, at a time when people were getting a work laptop that they used almost exclusively to actually work for the company. And that kind of made sense to have policies that gave the employer a lot of access to how that device is used. But we see with a lot of people working for large employers that they'll have one device. They don't want to have that second phone. So their entire personal life is going to be on this phone that is essentially accessible to the employer at its whim. And, you know, I'm hopeful that we'll see lawmakers pushing for broader protections there. I hope we'll see not just better notice requirements, but really protections against um, employer surveillance that goes further than what's really needed. Because I understand having some protections there to protect your network, to protect against uh, someone exploiting a a personal device or a a dual-use device to access your network. But that doesn't mean you have to have the right to look at literally everything they're doing. That line has blurred so much for so many of us. We use our work laptops for personal. We use our personal cell phones for work. They're kind of become one in the same. And I think a lot of people don't even think about it. So you've touched on this a little bit. And I think we, we've kind of started to to learn the answer. And it's not a, it doesn't sound like it's a happy one. But what are the laws around employee surveillance? I read that, and it's probably higher than this. I read that about 15% of employees don't know that their bosses are monitoring them. Are there kind of any protections in place or any kind of moves towards more transparency for employees to to know when and what is being tracked? Yeah, the laws vary from terrible to non-existent in (laughs) most states. Um, You know, some states require notification to employees, but notification doesn't actually mean telling people in a way where they understand. You know, oftentimes this can be fine print that gets buried in inside some lengthy handbook. Oftentimes it can be a quick mention as part of orientation. And so we do see some states like New York that are pushing for better disclosure, more effective disclosure, broader disclosure. But we also see a growing number of states that are looking at laws that would ban aspects of the surveillance, whether it's banning biometric tracking by employers, whether it's banning location tracking by employers on uh, employees' devices, And so it it really is something that is an active fight right now. Illinois has a lot of protections, for example, against employers' biometric surveillance. Uh, California has a number of interesting laws in this space as well. But, you know, clearly this is a national issue. And what we continue to see is just a Congress that is AWOL when it comes to surveillance and protecting the public from all the people who are trying to use our data against us. I think that New York is going to, in this upcoming legislative session, pass a number of bills around surveillance in the workplace. And I think we're going to have a lot of luck getting those additional protections. But I mean, this isn't just an issue in New York. This is an issue clearly nationwide and globally. And especially with, you know, workforces being so distributed now, too. I, you know, I don't know if a New York law would affect employees that live in, in other states as well. It always varies. I yeah, mean, yeah. I, I mean uh, some of these laws are based off of where the employee lives. Some of these laws are based off of where the employer's situation. Some of these laws are mishmash. So it definitely gets complicated. I, I guess the thing I always say as a caveat, because we lawyers love our disclaimers, if you have questions and or if you think your privacy has been violated, you should talk to a lawyer in your jurisdiction. That's kind of my biggest question here is what can employees do? If you, one, I guess, what can you do in your current job if you don't know you're being tracked and you wonder and you want to know? And what can you do if you're looking for a job and you want to kind of suss out if a company is using tracking software or any of these things? Yeah, I I mean, this is definitely something that, you know, when I'm advising students about their careers and, uh, you know, if they're asking me about their sort of privacy in the workplace, I I always say, yeah, this should be something that comes up 
if you're talking about a remote position or a, a position where that's flexible on location. You should understand how this data is being collected. And you know, you should also know how their device policies are gonna impact your, your uh, privacy as well. I think that when employees find out about this, they always have ways to speak up. They always can push back. But I, I also know that it's a really trying job market out there for a lot of folks. And I don't want to just say, oh, you, you just need to lead a protest or a walkout anytime you see this. You know, I, I think if you have questions about whether it's uh, legal or not, if you think you've encountered something that's deceptive or problematic, then I definitely would reach out to to uh, an employment lawyer and get a better sense of what your rights are in your state. But right now, a lot of us are just trying to understand the lay of the land, trying to understand what tools are actually being deployed. And, and so, you know, even just making anonymous uh, reports to groups like mine can be a big help in helping us understand the state of uh, workplace surveillance. That's all really helpful. And I think as you're speaking of like, yeah, if you're looking for a job, it can feel kind of awkward of how would you be like, so are you tracking your employees? Are you monitoring your employees? But I think that, you know, what's your device policy, you know, is maybe a, a subtler way into kind of <laughs> sussing it out. But it does seem like a black box in a lot of ways. And it sounds like there's not a lot of rules on what employers have to disclose either. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very different discussion if you're asking, so what are your privacy protections and what are your you know, device policies versus saying, I really don't want you to be in my business or look at anything I'm doing. Yeah. Like, you definitely can navigate that. And I think a lot of employers would be actually pleasantly surprised that someone would be that thoughtful about you know privacy and, uh, and data security issues. Because that probably means that person's thoughtful enough, they're not going to be the one who clicks on the link that gets their uh, network exploited. Another thing to keep in mind is that while there are a lot of states where employers don't have to tell you when they're tracking you, it's hard to imagine a state where it would be legal to lie about it. So certainly that can give you some peace of mind that unless they're willing to just flagrantly break the law, those reassurances should be meaningful. That's a really good point. Yeah, and it does feel like a lot of this does feel, as I said, really kind of creepy and dystopian, but, you know, hopefully if we beat the drum long enough, managers will start to understand that this is not the best way to manage their employees and employees would start to become more aware and more savvy. And hopefully we will start to move in the right direction rather than continue to kind of move in the wrong direction. Yeah, and I think this really is a win-win. This isn't a question of whether we want effective management or want to have workplace privacy. We get to have both because the technology is really just not living up to the claims that they make, and it's hurting you know your relationship with your employees in the process. So this is a way that we can build a better work experience for everyone and recognize that there isn't just some technological band-aid they can fix all of the hard work of making remote organizations work and making all of these different relationships work at a time when more and more of us are working from afar. Totally. I could not have said it better. Albert, thank you so much for joining me. This was such an enlightening and it, albeit a little bit scary conversation. <laughs> Always happy to contemplate dystopia <laughs> with you. Thank you so much for having me on. And that's all for this episode. If you're a new listener, be sure to subscribe to The New Way We Work wherever you listen. And if you like this episode, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And we want to hear from you. Work is changing every day. What's the most pressing issue on your mind? Email us at podcasts at fastcompany.com or tweet us with the hashtag The New Way We Work. The New Way We Work was produced by Joshua Christensen with editing by Nicholas Torres. 